All right, good deal. Um, so welcome back. Any questions up to here? So, um, so I'm sending out an announcement right after class to let people know that um, the meeting code for this class is going to change beginning tomorrow. Okay, so I'll send an announcement at 11 and it'll have the new meeting code in it. Um, and I'm going to ask that if you're registered for this section that you only attend this section. Okay, so you'll get the meeting code and a Canvas announcement. The school wants us to separate sections out and not mix them together. So. Um, everybody who's in the morning section is presumably attending the morning section. Um, and so um, you'll get a new meeting code and this meeting code will go away after uh, this weekend. So any questions about that, shoot me an email, but I'll be sending an announcement out um, right after class today. All right. Um, let me get this out of the way. All right, we talked about scanners a little bit yesterday as a way to do um, input from standard in, which may be useful for PA1 for you to, to, uh, to test your code, although you're certainly welcome to hardwire um, your testing and such. Let me um, point you to the Java documentation that I've referred to a few times, um, but on Canvas, there's just a link that says Java documentation. It takes you to um, an Oracle page. And it's not the most user-friendly page to go through, but for example, if you want to find out more about the string class, basically up here we have packages. Packages are collections of um, classes. So for example, the scanner class was part of java.utility. And here's the classes that, that belong to that. And down here you'll find scanner. And there's the documentation on the scanner. If you don't know what class an object belongs to, though, or what package a class belongs to, right, just start off with all classes and just go through here alphabetically. Unfortunately, there's so many classes, this is a little painful to, um, to actually navigate. But if you come up here and, and just do the hunt and peck, you can eventually find scanner or integer or string or anything else, okay? This is your go-to for, for documentation. You'll find lots of copies on it, but this is sort of um, the horse's mouth of um, what these classes do. Um, I got tired of doing that, and so I just cobbled together a bash script. I downloaded all the documentation, and if I wanna know documentation on, say, the string class, I can just say doc string, and it will find out what package it belongs to and bring up the documentation. If anybody's interested in that, let me know. I can share that code with you, but you know, I just kind of cobbled it together. It's it's a few bash scripts. Um, it's not really something I can just, you know, release and it's guaranteed to work. But if you're curious, if you want to practice bash, um, you know, it's a convenience that I made um, just so I don't have to constantly hunt through the, uh, the documentation. So, but you can do things like that, right? Because we're in a Unix environment, so um, so have fun with it. Um, all right, I want to talk about this idea of primitives. So, you know, I've said that everything in Java is a class, and that's mostly true with a few exceptions. For example, when I want to declare an integer, I just say integer i. And it's lowercase, which is significant, um, when I say integer i, i is actually not an object. It's something called a primitive. And so, let's make a main three.
Okay, so this is just junk code. Um, just to let us play around with some of these things. Um, so this this will do what what we would hope. So compile it, run it, and you know i is equal to ten. Um, if I wanted to stick with the realm of objects, I could do this. Right? And this is formally constructing an object of type integer, and I'm calling it i. And it kind of works and looks and feels like an integer. Right, The same code will still compile and execute exactly the same way, even though I formally said you know, i is an integer, and I'm constructing it with a value of 5. Um, but i is actually an object. Okay, And if we look at the documentation for the integer class, we see that there's a number of methods available, right? For example, um, well, let's find an interesting one. So, <laughs> so while well, there's a two-string method, right? There's kind of a two-string for i anyway. Um, int value will return this thing to uh, the int, right, primitive type associated with this integer, but that kind of happens for us anyway. Um, not a whole lot in here that we really care about. I'm ignoring all these things that say static, and, and we'll see why in, in a few moments. I'm writing notes to myself. All right, but this this is an integer, right? Um, but objects are expensive, right? They take memory. You have to construct them. You have to deconstruct them, stuff like that. Um, and so Java allows a few types of variables to be declared like this, okay? And they're basically um, there's an integer, there's a short integer, there's a long integer. So we've got three integer types. There's a float and a double. So we have two floating point types. Um, there's a byte, which is potentially different from a character, but it's an 8-bit entity. There's a character, which holds a single character, you know, a letter, a symbol, something like that. And then there's a Boolean. And those are your eight primitive types of data that you can declare with these lowercase types. And you can just say, you know, Boolean flag equals true. And you don't have to actually construct something by calling a constructor and so on. Um, but there are corresponding classes associated with this. For example, there's a class named car. There's a class named Boolean. And so on. So if you look at the documentation, oh, there isn't a, there's a class named character. And if you look at the documentation for that, it's got all kinds of methods associated with it um, for comparing two characters. Um, I compare a character to another character, um, finding the numeric value of the character, and, and so on and so forth. So, so when we are first writing code, right, unless we're dealing with an object like a string or a rectangle or an even, right, we're probably just going to be using these primitive types. And that's another sense in which this looks and feels a lot like C, okay, because, you know, these are certainly things that we recognize from, um, from plain old C programming. Booleans are a little different, though. Booleans are an actual type, right? In pure C, Boolean is not an actual type. It's built out of integers. Um, in, in Java, it is a type. Um, so I can do something like this.
So, so since flag is a Boolean, right, we can use it anywhere that the language is expecting a Boolean result, for example, inside an if statement. Okay, so this, this should compile. Right, and it tells us flag is true. And if we do something like flag equals not flag, that should negate it. And then it'll tell us flag is false. And if we try to make flag an integer, right, it's going to complain. Booleans can't be converted to ints. So in C, we do this kind of trick where we, we treat 0 as false and non-zero as true. And if we have an integer variable, we can use that as a flag and say if variable. And we understand that if the variable is 0, it's treated as a false. And if it's non-zero, it's true. That's nice in C. That's not allowed in Java. Okay, in Java, if you want to use flags, actually use a Boolean. So make a Boolean flag. And if we wanted to know if i was non-zero, we could do something like if i not equal to zero, for example. Okay, and you know, if then structures exactly the same in in Java as they are in C, right? So if condition, um, statement, else other statement, right? And if you have multiple things in here, you could put this inside curly brackets and so on and so forth. So all that stuff works the same. Um, we can also do, you know, something like this, all right? So um, let's get rid of this complement, all right? So flag equals one bigger than zero, and that turns out to be true. Flag equals one bigger than a thousand, and that turns out to be false. So when we do a comparison operation, either something as simple as this or something compound with ors and ands and things like that, the result is a true or false value. Anytime you have a true or false value, you can assign it to a Boolean variable. Okay, so Booleans are, um, are built into the language. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm kind of. I said I'd be going through like different stuff today. So, um, we create rectangles. We create even numbers, right? We do. We do all these different things. And I've said when you use the new keyword, I got rid of all my stuff. Um, When, when you use the new keyword to create an object like a rectangle, for example, um, we're allocating memory. We're creating um, locations in memory where we can store the fields of the object. And um, it's taking the place of what we used to do with malloc, right? So um, if we say something like, you know, even x equals new even 16 right this is doing a bunch of things it's finding a spot in memory where an even can be stored it's allocating that space right marking it as reserved it's calling the constructor which in the case of our even is setting a field maybe named value equal to 16 um, and then it's returning some kind of reference to that location in memory and setting x equal to that so that when we try to do something with x it refers to that particular even that object um, so this is kind of doing you know what we used to do with malloc what about free um, we don't have a free function in java and it turns out we don't need one because there's there's something called a garbage collector And garbage collectors are wonderful things. They basically go around, they find memory that's not being used anymore, and they reclaim it. So any time that you do something that in C would have caused you to have a memory leak, the garbage collector in the Java Virtual Machine will theoretically go ahead and reclaim that memory for you. Okay. So here, you know, I've said x is equal to new even. 
So x is pointing to, so, so this is creating you know, an even number named 16, and it's saying that x refers to that. Okay, so this is not gonna get garbage collected because it's in use. But if later on I were to say x equals new even 28, this is gonna create an even object with a value of 28, and x is going to refer to that. At some point, the garbage collector in the JVM is going to notice, here's a blob of memory, an even object named 16, with nothing referring to it. And it's going to reclaim that. Okay, It's going to basically do a free, and this will go back into the memory pool. And this happens automatically for us. Now, um, the upside of that you know, is pretty clear. We don't have to worry about calling free. But that's, that's potentially not a good thing, right? That potentially lets you get kind of sloppy in your coding. Um, and if you know what you're doing, that's okay, but, um, but it, can, it can hide other issues. Um, the downside is, you know, sometimes you've allocated a big chunk of memory for temporary use, and now you know you're done with it, you would like to release it, okay? Well, we don't have a free option, but we can actually call the garbage collector and ask it to come and, and pick up what's not being used. Um, and the garbage collector is, is pretty smart. If I say something like even y equals x, right? So x was pointing to this object 16. Now I've said y points to this object 16. Now I make a new even 28 and I have x point to that. The garbage collector will know something is still referring to this, this object, in particular y, and it won't collect this. It'll wait until it's unused, meaning nothing is referring to it. Okay, so it's really, it's really resolving memory leaks as they happen. Um, and that's kind of nice. There's, there's lots of languages that have garbage collectors. Lisp is, is the first one I encountered that just kind of does this for you. Um, so that's kind of cool. All right, um, let's dig into something nice. So, um, I've told you I want you to type public static void main 80 million times this quarter, right, so that you get good at it. I've already done that myself, and I don't like typing that in and taking time to type it, so I've, I've got some convenience functions I've made. For example, if I say init, it makes a file called main.java, which looks like that, right? If I want to start a rectangle class, I can say init rectangle, and it will give me a, a template for a rectangle class, including a main method. Um, so I'm going to use those just so you don't have to watch me type and typo public static void main 80 million times. But go ahead and, and you know type it in longhand yourself. Um, and all these utilities I have, they're just simple bash scripts, right? So it's just it's good stuff from 224. All right, so let's make a main class. Let's talk about this args. Okay, um, public static void main. Public means you know things outside this file can access it. Static, I'm still not ready to talk about. Void says the function doesn't return anything. Main is the name of the function, and our main program has to be named main. Okay, this is a list of arguments, and we're saying there's a single argument to this main method called args. And it's an argument of type string. And it's string bracket bracket. We have this syntax in C also that strongly suggests that args is going to be an array of strings, and that's exactly what it is. So let's let's take a look at this. Um, let's print out args bracket zero. And let's print the value of args bracket zero. And let's, while we're at it, also print the value of args bracket one. So I'm gonna say Java main, and I'm going to put some arguments after it. I'm gonna say Java main, this is a test. And guess what, args bracket zero is this, args bracket one is is. So args is the, the equivalent of argc, argv. It's a way to access these command line arguments, these things that you specify after the name of the 
class that you want to execute main from. So Java main, and then these are arguments. So Java main arg1, arg2, arg3, arg4, arg5, right? And they start from index zero. So, um, you know, as usual with arrays. Um, and, and this is, you know, basically your argv array. So your first argument is zero, your second argument is one. But unlike C, we don't get the name of the class, right, as one of the arguments. So I said Java main, main does not appear as one of the arguments. The first argument, arg bracket zero, is the first argument that I specified after this. So let me be a little cleaner about this. Let me call my first argument arg0, and now you know you can see the correlation. OK, um, if I don't specify command line arguments, that's perfectly legal. But if I try to access args bracket 0, I'm going to get an error. My error is array index out of bounds 0. And that's telling me there is no element 0 in my array. All right, well, how do I know? that I don't have an element zero unless I try to access it and I get an exception. Um, so it turns out, you know, and I've been promising you this for a while, that in Java, arrays are, are things that include the length of the array. When we make an array, the part of that array actually has information that tells us how many things are in that array. And if we have, let's say, a string, bracket, bracket, args, it turns out there's a field args.length, which will tell us how many things are in this array. Okay, and this is different. This is different from a method. Right. For example, if s is a string, there's a method called length that we can call s dot length paren paren. This is not a method we're calling. This is think of it as a field inside args. Okay, args dot length without parentheses on here. It's just a number, and it's a number whose value is the number of things in the array. So let's look at that. So let's just look at args.length. And let's compile our program and run our program. And if I don't put any arguments, args.length is 0. If I say this is fun, args.length is 3. If I do arg 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, args.length is 6. All right, everybody following this? So args.length is kind of like what argc used to be. But because you know we're object focused, we have a single argument which contains, you know, the actual arguments and information about how many arguments are stored in here, namely its length. So if we wanted to print out all of the arguments, we could make a simple for loop. something like this. So let's go ahead and print out the lengths again in the top. And then we'll just iterate from 0 till um, the end uh, value less than the length, right? Because we're index 0. And let's print out args bracket, the value of i. Um, and then a close bracket equals. And then let's print out args bracket i. So compile that and run it, and args length is 6, and there's the 6 arguments. All right, so there's 4 arguments, and we can access those. So it's pretty straightforward to get arguments from the command line with Java. Um, and, you know, of course, 
args is not a magic word. Right? It's just a variable. We could call it ha ha just as easily. So we can get arguments from the command line. Um, suppose we wanted to write a function or a, a Java program that would add up all of the numbers on the command line and tell us what the sum is. Right? We could have a loop like this. So let me make a new. Let me make a new function. So let's get rid of that. Let's have a sum. And we just like to add args bracket i to sum. Okay, this is not going to work. Right? It makes sense. We want to take some, we want to add args bracket i. But that's not going to work for us because we're asking to add a string to an integer. Well, if sum was a string, right, we just get a string plus a string. If we were assigning to a string, it would convert this integer to a string and then concatenate this string. But since we're trying to assign to an integer sum, right, it's trying to add a sum to an int, to a, a string, and you can't do that. It doesn't make sense, right? And it doesn't know how to automatically convert this string to an integer. And even if the string is, you know, 25, it's still a string. It's two characters, a 2 followed by a 5. So we need to be able to um, convert this string to an int. So you can look at the string class. And we can change integers to uppercase and lowercase and strings, which you know is silly because it's already a string, and so on. But there's there's nothing in here that tells us how to change this string into an integer. Okay. It turns out that the integer class has ways to do this. So if you look at the documentation for an integer, we will see some methods in here such as um, parseInt. Okay, so parseInt is a method that takes a string and it returns an integer. Okay, and it says it parses the string argument as a signed decimal integer. The characters of the string must all be decimal digits, except the first character may be a minus sign. Okay, so this is this is what we used to do with scanf, right, or scanf to take a string of characters and change them to an int. Well, there's there's a method inside the integer class. Okay, so here's the tricky thing. The integer class contains a method called parseInt. But inside my code, I don't have an integer type object. I have a primitive integer type sum, but I don't have anything of type integer, right? I haven't constructed an integer object. So how am I going to run this method that's part of the integer class? And it turns out this is a special type of method. It's something called a static. OK, so a static method is a method that you don't need an object in order to run it. So, so kind of heavy concept here. 
Um, if I have a rectangle called R, and I've constructed it and so on, if I want to find the area of that rectangle, I can say name of the object dot area. Okay, it runs this method as part of this object. And if there's a height and a width being used in this method, it'll be the height and the width of this object R. Okay, this is called an instance method. All right, this method is being run as part of an instance, right, of this object, of, of this class rectangle. Um, there are other methods called class methods. And the example you'll always hear me talk about is square root, right? Inside the math class, there's a square root function. And we can run this by just saying the name of the class dot square root. Okay, so most methods we've talked about so far we treat them as a field of an object, right? We have an object of type rectangle, we say object dot, and then the method. But these class methods are different. Instead of using the name of an object of type math, we actually use the word math, okay? With the uppercase M in the beginning. This is the name of a class, and we're saying inside that class, you'll find a method called square root. That's what I wanna run. And to do this, we don't need an instance of the math class. Okay, so this is a class method. This is also called a static method. And don't sweat too much exactly how all of this works, okay? This is, this is we just started talking about objects a few days ago. So this is, this is kind of a weird, you know, twist on objects. Um, suffice for now to understand how to use these static methods and what they actually mean to be static versus an instance method will come with time. Um, but if you look at the documentation and you see this keyword static next to a method, it means that to use that method, you actually use the name of the class, which in this case is integer. So if I want to parse an integer, I'm going to say uppercase integer dot int and then I'm going to pass it a string. All right, so let's try this. Um, so we'll comment that out. call integer.parsint on args bracket i. And we'll do this across all of the arguments and then at the end we'll print out the sum. So that looks promising so far. Let's go ahead and run it. So let's do 2 plus 4 plus 7. And it tells us the sum is 13. So that's correct. Um, let's do one plus one. One plus one is two. All right, so, so there's lots of useful um, static methods inside the integer class, inside the string class, inside the math class, okay? Um, and you know, in math, for example, um, almost all of the methods are um, static. So if we want to take the absolute value of a double, a float, an integer, a long, etc., if we want to take trigonometric functions, um, forward and inverse, if we want to do hyperbolic cosines, right, um, exponentiation, uh, floors and ceilings, square roots, my favorite, um, there are, are static methods for doing that.
Okay, so if I want to find the hyperbolic sine of a double, I just do uppercase math dot S-I-N-H. And like I say, if, if it's really confusing right now what exactly is going on with these, don't sweat it. Okay, you can use these without really understanding like what the distinction is at this point. Um, if you want to use a method and it says static, just say the name of the class dot the method. Um, but things like length, right, if we look at the string class and we want to find the length of a string, that's not a static, right? And to say uppercase string dot length wouldn't make any sense because what are you taking the length of, right? Length as an abstract function doesn't make any sense unless you're giving it an argument. And the length function doesn't take an argument. So uppercase string dot length wouldn't, wouldn't be meaningful, right? Um, whereas uppercase math dot square root of this number, right, makes perfect sense. All right, so, um, so, so if you look at the double class, for example, um, it has methods such as uh, parse double, right, which will take a string, convert it into a double. This integer class has a few parsers. You can parse int, um, a string changes it to a decimal integer. You can also do a version of parse int that takes two arguments, a string and a radix or a base, right? And it will treat your argument as being in that base. So for example, um, You know, if I try to do one and f, I'll get an exception, right? Input string f, it's a number format exception. It doesn't know how to convert f to a decimal, okay? Because it's, it's not, you know, a valid decimal number. Um, but if I wanted to make a hexadecimal sum program, I can just say, let's do this parseInt in radix 16, that's hex. And now I can compile this, and if I run it, it tells me 1 plus f is equal to 16. So there's a lot of power in these, these classes, right? Um, and it's all built into Java, right? Now we can import other things like scanners, but just in the, the base Java package, um, we've got all this capability. Okay, so it's really worth spending some time getting comfortable with the documentation um, so that, you know, when you're trying to figure out how to parse something or convert something or format something, right, you, um, you've at least looked at documentation before, you kind of know how it's laid out, um, and you can, you can look around and try to find things. Um, and the documentation always has the same style, the same look and flavor. Um, and and basically, you know, it starts off with the name of the class, a list of what it is. An integer is actually a particular type of number, which is a particular type of object. Okay, this is class extension. This is how we made a my frame that extended a J frame. And we'll talk a lot about this later on. Um, a description of the class. Um, a list of fields that you can access. So for example, if you want to know the maximum value that an integer can have, you can say integer dot max value. You can say integer dot size, it'll tell you how many bits are being used to represent an integer. Okay, so these are fields that are always available and then ways to construct an integer. Turns out we can construct an integer by passing a string or by passing an int. Right, so that's another way to parse. And then a list of methods that are available. So um, the type of method, and is it a, a static? Um, and then name of it, list of arguments and argument types, and then a one line description. And then you can click through to these and get a more detailed description. So for example, I can say bit count, and it'll tell me how many um, one bits there are in the number. 
Okay. Which, you know, maybe you never have to do that, but it's potentially useful. We can rotate left and right, and so on and so forth. Reverse the bits in a number. Um, tons of stuff in here. And it turns out that when you're documenting your code, saying slash star, you know, comment star slash, or slash slash comment, um, if you start a comment with slash star star, with two asterisks, so like this, There's a utility called Javadoc. And Javadoc will look for comments in this form. And if you write your comments in a very certain way, it will automatically generate documentation for you that looks like this. And it's a wonderful thing because now you can document your own code, your own classes, using this, this style that everybody who uses Java has seen and is hopefully familiar with and you generate documentation that looks exactly like this. Um, and that's useful. So we'll, if, if we have time, we'll talk about Javadoc um, sometime this quarter. And when we get into um, playing with Eclipse as an integrated development environment, um, you can have it generate Javadoc for you automatically. And if you just say slash star star enter, it will fill in a template. If you do that right before a method, it will fill in a template that lets you just uh, type in, you know, a description of, of the method. It will list all the arguments and let you specify what they are. And it turns it into this, this beautiful format. So, um, so lots of support for um, documenting your code um, as long as you actually write the comments. So Java lets us do printfs. If you don't like print, I, print line, if you don't like concatenating things together, you can still do a printf. Okay. So system.out.printf sum equals percent d backslash n unquote comma sum. All right. This is C code, um, but there's a printf function that works exactly like printf from C. So if you prefer that old way, if that's if that's your comfort zone, you can use printfs. Nothing wrong with that. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's a little clearer what this is instead of, of you know, lots of opening and closing quotes with, with plus signs in between. Um, and sometimes, you know, you want to format something in a very particular way. Um, if we wanted exactly four digits, including leading zeros, right, we could do something like this. Sum equals zero, 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 0006 by just using a percent zero four d so print line is really quick and dirty, and it's often good enough. But if you want more control, right, you can go back to printf, and that's um, that's another option. All right. Well, that was a a fairly random collection of things, um, but all good stuff, hopefully. So, um, so any questions? So, um, I would like to do tomorrow as an open lab. Okay, I don't think I'm going to do this every week, but since PA1 is your first, you know, Java program um, that you're writing the code for yourself, if you haven't done Java before, I want to use tomorrow class time for open lab, meaning that. Um, you know, people can screen share, we can do one on one um, meetings, you can show me your code, we can we can voice chat, um, and so on and so forth. So um, I'm not going to plan a lecture for tomorrow. Okay, I think I've given you enough stuff to to contemplate. Um, but if you have questions about any of this material, or if you 
are having troubles with your code or um, everybody got git figured out so um, and I figured out what I was doing wrong in a few cases so um, if you're having troubles with your code or getting things to run correctly and so on right let's spend tomorrow class time talking about that um, and we'll meet at the new um, zoom session that will um, be on a canvas announcement in a few minutes um, and we'll go from there all right. Cool. So I will push this code over to the server and I will upload um, video from today and I will catch you all next time. All right. Have a good afternoon.